All right, let's slowly get started. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming back from the buffet um, to this uh, uh, last talk. Um, yeah, we're very happy uh, and grateful that uh, Robert Kellerbank agreed uh, to give uh, an evening, evening talk uh, titled Back to the Future. Uh, for all the Gen Z among you, this is a film that came out 40 years ago. Um, and uh, Robert Kellerbank, of course, is the, the C in CSS, and we are very grateful for that because it makes our life as quantum coding theory is very, very easy. Um, but today he will talk about um, the history of, of coding theory through the lens of um, Reed-Muller codes. Yeah, so please take it away. Okay, thank you um, very much for uh, the introduction. So this is intended as an after-dinner talk, I guess an after-reception talk. And I was looking at it before I uh, showed up for the reception, and um, it, it's, it, I, I've given it to classical coding audiences, which means that perhaps there's a little too much introductory quantum stuff for this audience, but then I'll skip over that fast, and so maybe it'll be a shorter after-dinner talk. So what I'm going to start with is a short history of measurement. And so in 1950, Hamming is super excited because he's discovered this infinite family of perfect single error correcting binary codes. Um, actually, he stays super excited for about a year because I think Hamming was, so Hamming publishes this paper and then Golay looks at his paper and says, ooh, I wonder if there are more perfect codes lying around. And he's sitting in front of the fire, and he's, he's just figuring out when a sum of binomial coefficients is equal to a power of 2. And he discovers that the parameters for the Golay code work. And then he finds the Golay code. And then Hamming is just perpetually pissed off because <laughs> he feels that this should have been his code. Um, so. um, but the, actually, what I, what I um, and then we get uh, Reed Muller codes, um, Reed Solomon codes, and these have, you know, in some sense, one of the, you know, when I think about impact for coding theory, I think about, how many billions of devices are your codes in? And with Solomon codes, every computer memory. So that's many billions of devices. That's hugely impactful. But the thing about the 1950s and 1960s is coding theory is mathematics. It's the mathematics of sphere packing. Why is it the mathematics of sphere packing? Because I, mean, I look around and throw it. It's hard for some of you guys to remember a time when we had no computers, right? When you have no computers, all you have is mathematics. All you have is sphere packing. But what an, one of the things that I, uh, that was a history of coding theory. There's a parallel history of measurement. And this is primarily what we think of nowadays as statisticians. And in the 1930s, Yates was thinking about weighing designs. What is a weighing design? You have a bunch of pennies. One of them weighs more than the others. You're going to weigh these pennies in combination, and you're going to figure out which is the heavy penny. Okay, that's the theory of weighing designs. And <clears throat> it's a precursor of the theory of compressed sensing. Um, <clears throat> So 
So here's you know, history of, you know, this is compressed sensing. And it's compressed sensing is all about measuring things in combination. Uh, but in 1942, that's eight years before Hamming, Fisher discovers the Hamming code. I want to tell that story. So if you didn't know anything, I mean, if you knew about the quantum reed muller code, so things like this, maybe this is something that's new. And I learned this from Peter Cameron, um, who was uh, my master's advisor at Oxford and has written a number of beautiful books about combinatorial mathematics. And uh, he wrote this paper, Some Bridges Between Codes and Designs. And this picture here is intended to illustrate the difference between information theorists and statisticians. How does that work? So if you're an information theorist, you're given a channel. And you have to figure out how, does, how to design inputs so that you can tell outputs apart at the output of the channel. Okay, that's, and Shannon, this is his description of information theory. Uh, he came up with this idea that channels have capacity and uh, change the world. Now, if you're a statistician, you look at this picture in a different way. So if you're a statistician, you say, I have this process. I have inputs and I have outputs. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to infer the channel, right? So that's what statistical design is all about. And this discovery of the Hamming codes is really about that connection between, because Fisher um, <clears throat> didn't work at a university. He worked at this agricultural experimental station. And so they were trying to figure out, it's like the University of California. Why is the University of California appreciated by the state of California? Because it tells you how to grow crops, right? Um, there's a number of other things too, but it's basically agricultural and it has a number of scientific um, peripherals. Um, and so here, you, there are things that you're trying to grow and, there and you have factors that might make them grow better. And you systematically expose your crops to a different mix of factors and you measure how well they grow. And so here, let's suppose that um, you're, looking at, you're, you're looking at factors that can take one of two levels, zero and one. So when I make my matrix that describes the experimental design, it's gonna be a binary matrix. And Fisher, for simplicity, wanted to think about treatment matrices that had a group structure. And so he's thinking that, that his, his experiments that he's going to run, they're going to be a subgroup of Z2 to the M. Okay. Now, what's Fisher interested in? He wants to tell good factors from bad factors. When he looks at his group and he sees something in the dual group, let's say of weight 3, EI plus EJ plus EK, he can't work out whether the effect of the ith factor, he can't tell that apart from the interaction of the jth and the kth factor. And so he's interested in subgroups for which the dual has a high weight because then he can see more clearly which main factors matter and which are, are not um, and so in a, factorial in a factorial design, um, he wants few trials, and actually this should be C perp. Um, <clears throat> sorry, no, it shouldn't. So, so here B is his, his code, it's his group. Uh, C is the dual. Um, and, um, and of course, if he has a small number of trials, he has a big code. What does he want? He wants a large weight in C because he wants not to be 
um, disturbed by confounding. Now, in an error correcting code on a binary symmetric channel, uh, we want a large number of code words, so we're consistent with this. And we also want a large minimum weight. And so it's so Hamming codes satisfy both objectives. So whether you come at them, whether you come at the problem from the coding theoretic point of view or the statistics point of view, you end up at the same place. So that's um, I think that that's a little bit of history that um, could stand to be. I don't know. Statisticians could be appreciated more. Uh, now, <clears throat> I'm going to say a little bit about second order Reed Muller codes. And I always think that it's important in a talk to actually prove something. So I'm going to prove something. And here, my, my, so I'm going to talk about second order Reed Muller codes. If you learned your coding theory or you read, uh, coding theory from the book by McWilliams and Sloan. Chapter 15 is about second order Reed Muller codes. And it uses the normal form for quadratic forms to derive all the results. What I'm going to show you is a way of deriving all of those results in a completely different way. Um, <clears throat> so let me remind you about Reed Muller codes. Reed Muller codes, functions of degree less than or equal to one on binary strings of length m. There's the constant function. There are these linear functions. First order Reed Muller code is linear functions plus the constant. Uh, the simplex code is the linear code consisting of all of the linear functions. It's a code with length. If you, let's Let's get rid of the zero coordinate. It's got length two to the m minus one. It's got dimension m. All the non-zero weights are equal to two to the m minus one. That's the size of the complement of a hyperplane. Now, let's talk about second order Reed Muller codes. So these are functions of degree utmost two, evaluated of vectors in the same way. What does it mean to be a quadratic function? It means that you satisfy this where R is some uh, symmetric matrix, symplectic matrix, that means symmetric with zero diagonal. Here's an example. X1, X2, we all know that that's a quadratic function. And here is the R corresponding to that quadratic function. Now, it's actually really easy to see that the rank of R has to be even. There's a lovely recursion in McWilliams and Sloan which, which counts the number of solutions and out of which it shows that the uh, that if there was a so that the number of odd rank solutions has to be zero. It's a very nice, uh... All right, so quadratic functions they're they're in one to one correspondence with these symplectic matrices R, which have even rank. Okay, so now. The central theorem in chapter 15 of McWilliams and Sloan is the weight distribution of cosets of the first order Reed Muller code in the second. So here we're going to take the first order Reed Muller code and we're going to take a translate by some quadratic function Q. Okay. And here I'm going to derive this theorem, mostly derived this theorem, which tells you what the weights are. And the important thing about the weights is that they're powers of two. We're going to come back to that at the end when we talk about quantum. Um, and this proof is, it's completely different from the McWilliams and Sloan proof. And I'm motivated in the following way. My friends who are analysts say that in analysis, there's kind of one trick. What they say is, when in doubt, integrate by parts. And what I'm going to show you is a number theorist trick for evaluating trigonometric sums. And 
what my number theorist friend tells me is that they only have really one trick, and that's to square the sum. So we'll do that. Okay. So here, um, I'm going to think about the radical of R. That's the set of vectors x for which xr is 0. So now when you think about the, the, what it means to be a quadratic function, it means that this is going to vanish on the radical, which means that on the radical, you're going to be a linear function. Okay? So when you, when you sum this linear function over the radical, um, <clears throat> you're, for, for any L, you're either going to get 0 or the size of the radical, depending on whether this linear function coincides with that or not. So there are two possibilities. It's 2 to the m minus 2h because r has rank 2h. Now then, <clears throat> having, having done that, having evaluated this function sl, I'm going to get more ambitious, and instead of summing x just over the radical, I'm going to sum it over all m strings. And if I can figure out what the sum is, then I know what the weight is. Right? Because it's 2 to the m minus twice the weight. All right, I told you I had one trick. I'm going to square it. It's t sub a. It should be t sub l, I think. t sub l squared. So the one trick is you square it. So now instead of just q of x, you have q of x and q of y. This linear part, l of x plus y, is just l of z because it's linear. And if you think about the different, if you think about q of x plus y, you can think of that as being q of z plus another term. And it's basically this. Um, why is it the minus? See, so when you have q of x plus y, you have like a, a yr x transpose and an x y y transpose. And you, you pick up this guy. And so when you simplify this sum, you have a sum over z's. And then you have this other sum outside. And this is much easier, right? Because it's, um, first of all, this y r y transpose disappears because r is symmetric with zero diagonal. So that's going to disappear. So it's just z r y transposed. And you're summing over all the y, all y, all binary strings y. And the only time you get a positive contribution is when z is actually in the radical. And so this equation just simplifies to that. And you already knew what this was. So now you know what all the weights are. And this lemma is a very easy way of getting all of the results in McWilliams and Sol chapter 15. Um, anyway, so one of the one of the takeaways here is that um, read Muller codes in general are special. Um, I'm going to assert a theorem about divisibility of weights by powers of two. I prove the special case here of second order read Muller codes. All right, so RM, read Muller codes degree R, uh, functions of degree less than or equal to R, that's the dimension. Um, there's a theorem that all weights are multiples of this power of two. I'm not going to prove that theorem. I'm just going to 
make it more plausible by showing you that it's true. Uh, what I would want, what I would like to do is to say one of the things that's special about reed muller codes is that they have a recursive construction. And, um, and so here I'd like to say something a little bit as a teaser for perhaps what's not to come about quantum is um, um, I've been so there's physical gates and there's logical gates. You'd really like to apply like a transversal T and have some code where you get a logical T. You'd like to be able to do universal computation in that way. And in fact, you'd like to be able to take some operator that lives somewhere high in the Clifford hierarchy, and you'd like to find some code that's fixed by that operator. And I had a couple of graduate students, Jingxian Hu and Qingxiang Liang, who thought about this question. And um, so this is like a stranded result. I'll talk about how, I mean, what we were interested in, so you start off, you have a code that's invariant under the phase gate. What we wanted to do is to start from that code and to produce something higher in the hierarchy that was fixed by a higher level operator. What we allowed ourselves to do was to first concatenate. So sometimes what would happen there is we produce a code that was twice as long that was still invariant under the phase gate. That wasn't getting us any higher in the hierarchy. But then we had a way of taking out stabilizers and getting something, a code that was fixed by, let's say, the T gate, where the code, the induced transformation was the T gate. And we had a way of climbing the Clifford hierarchy. And so I'm, I'm very interested in, in this kind of um, construction. All right, so now we've done classical world. And, um, you know, the thing about the classical world and the thing about sphere packing and symmetries is it's beautiful mathematics. And, um, I mean, and that mathematics is still going strong today. I mean, this result of Marina Vyazovsky is, is extraordinary. Um, but, I mean, here, I think the point of this slide is that research changes as technology changes. So in the 60s, everything was mathematics because there were no computers. As in 1990, the computer on your desk could do dynamic programming with a graph with four states. Right? I mean, hard to imagine that now. In fact, Gallagher um, LDPC codes, 1960 PhD thesis. I mean, computers weren't powerful enough to do the simulations, which would have proved that Gallagher's codes were fantastic. And in fact, you know, it was more than 20 years. We had to rediscover his results and rediscover how great they were in order to fully appreciate his contribution. But um, it was only in the 1990s that, that computers sort of turned the corner and became really capable of doing things. And as they become really capable of doing things, um, the character of coding theory changes. It becomes less about sphere packing, and it becomes more about the performance of iterative decoding. There's this lovely book here by um, by by Rina Banku and um, on, uh, on modern coding theory. 
I've always thought that um, it was, um, I mean, I like the title, it's, but it's almost like saying, you guys, you weren't doing modern coding theory. <laughs> I am. Um, uh, but, but, uh, but, and Tom Richardson, it's, it's, I mean, it's a beautiful book. And actually for us coding theorists that have sort of, for, for whom this co for, for whom this development has become part of our DNA, it's really weird to look at the quantum world and see people argue about rate and minimum distance for LDPC codes. Because in the classical world, this stuff doesn't matter. I mean, if you're doing data storage, you don't care about the minimum distance of your LDPC code. Why don't you care? Because the probability that the noise takes you in a bad direction is so small that it's statistically insignificant. Now, maybe these things change as the error probabilities become much, 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 much more significant. But still, it's kind of weird for us. This book is the source of a lot of things that might be interesting in the quantum world. I mean, in the quantum world, there is no analog of um, density evolution or looking at the performance of belief propagation. Also in this paper, there is a beautiful treatment of window decoding in LDPC codes. So the idea here is that you look as a subset of the coordinates. You build a decoder that just works on the subset. It's suboptimal, but still effective. So I think that these are still ideas that are worth exploring today. Now, basically this slide says, you mathematicians, you spent all your time thinking about sphere packing, thinking about symmetries. That stuff was useless. Now, one of my favorite results is that Reed Muller codes achieve capacity on erasure channels. And um, one of the things I really, first of all, I mean, Henry is sitting in the audience. This is his result. Um, what I really like about this result is that symmetry plays an essential part. So here, it's really about monotone graph properties. So if you have an erasure channel, that's to say where bits can either get through without change, or they can get erased. The more erasures you have, the less information you have, the less well you're gonna do. That's what it means by monotone. And you can think about the equivocation of each variable. Now, one of the wonderful things, one of the wonderful properties of the symmetry of Reed Muller codes is that that equ equivocation function doesn't depend on the bit you chose. And so um, uh, that in combination with this, uh, this, this result here about symmetric monotone Boolean functions having a short thre sharp threshold gives you the, the result that um, these read Muller codes achieve capacity on the binary relationship. Um, Edish had this notion of proofs from the book. So Edish was a funny person. Right? I mean, Edish um, didn't believe in God, but he believed that there were God-given proofs. That is to say, the natural, most beautiful proof. I think that this is the proof from the book. That the not quite proof, not from the book, is the previous paper by Abbe and Widgerson, which is which is really interesting, but very intricate, and it doesn't have this this property. Quantum computing I should say something about quantum computing. Um, <clears throat> 
So this picture is intended to um, create the impression that physicists do really complicated things with lots of wires. And that in some, I mean, in some sense, in 1940, a regular computer was like this. It was like a room full of wires. And how did it change? Well, things miniaturized. This is a, this is a Sandia Labs picture of 83 atoms being held above some chip. Um, so there's, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say that, I mean, at IonQ and uh, other places too, there's been a lot of work that's made um, quantum computing uh, more scalable. Quantum error correction. All right, so here's the, the things that you guys know already, uh, but general, perhaps mathematical audiences don't know. This is the way that undergraduates think matrices should be multiplied together. Um, this is just um, uh, the, the, uh, the framework for computing. Um, this is what it means to measure. This is the error model. So I would say something here. Um, it's an after dinner talk, so I can make after dinner remarks. One of the things I notice about my colleague, Ken Brown, is that we introduce the Clifford group in different ways. Ken introduces it from the ground up. He shows you what the transformations are on two qubits. That's actually not the way that I do it from the group down. And why do I do that? I, it's, it's in part the way that I learned this stuff. Right? So if you're a mathematician, so mathematicians are funny people. They're actually not very good at words. Right? So mathematicians, they have groups. They have special groups. And they have extra special groups. I don't know, actually know what happens after that. I'm not sure they do either. Uh, but the Pauli group is the extra special group. Actually, if you pick up Ashbacher's group on group book on group theory, he will tell you all about extra special groups. Um, but nowhere will you find that. There's a physical reason to be interested in them. And if you're a mathematician of a certain kind, let's say a finite geometer, you know that the maximal commutative subgroups in the Pauli group are really interesting because they're related to what is called orthogonal geometry. And when you ask for the, the, the normalizer of the Pauli group and the unitary group, you, of course, get the Clifford group. And that moves the maximal commutative subgroups around, moves it transitive. Um, <clears throat> now, in, so here I get to, in this after dinner talk, I get to tell you how I um, came upon the um, stabilizer code formalism. Right, so I have the greatest admiration for Gottesman because he thought his way to that formalism through physics. My story is that I was trying to understand these papers by Schumacher and they had physics experiments and there was stuff that they were doing and I didn't really understand the physics experiment, but I could actually calculate the group. And it was the Clifford group. And so at that point, I knew that these codes had something to do with the Clifford group, the maximal commutative subgroups. Actually, I tell a story about Eric Raines, 
who um, is now at Caltech and was at uh, Bell Labs for a while. We wrote papers together with Peter Shaw. Um, story about, I mean, he originally worked at IDA in Princeton, looking for an academic job, and he came to interview at Bell Labs. And, um, and the way that you interviewed at Bell Labs was you gave a talk, and then you interviewed with like eight people, and then we made a decision. And, um, and so um, Eric Rains was due to meet with Ron Graham, who was the director of the Math Center. But we couldn't find Ron Graham because he was hiding somewhere. And so um, Eric and Peter Shore and Neil Sloan and me spent two hours in my office working on this thing. We have a PRL paper which has it has a, I mean, when you, when you have a paper in Google Scholar, you look at the citation record. This is like a 1998 paper. And in 2023, it's like just crossing a thousand citations. And so it's like 30 years. Um, and what I remember about this paper was that, um, I think we were assigned a shepherd because mathematically it was a little complicated. Actually, I look at some of these papers in quantum about topological X and I think, where was your shepherd? <laughs> I'm not understanding this paper. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, this is the Pauli group. This is the symplectic inequality. Um, let's just talk about syndrome decoding of codes. Um, so here I'm just going to, I'm going to have two slides. I'm going to make a correspondence between the classical world and the quantum world. So here's the classical world, error group. Stabilizer is just a subspace of binary space. Stabilizer acts by binary addition. It fixes the code. We have a resolution of the identity, just like we have in quantum just a union of cosets. Binary symmetric channel takes you to a coset. When you do syndrome decoding, it identifies the coset. It doesn't identify the vector in the coset. There is a most probable way to have gotten to that coset. You just invert that, that's how you decode. Quantum world, but it's the same picture. You have a resolution of the identity. You figure out which part you're in. There's a most probable way to have gotten there. You invert it. All right, CS and the stabilizer groups. Um, so these are, um, this is just uh, how we do that. All right, let me talk about this. So here, um, I, I made some remark before about stranded research. So. With Jing Shen and Qing Chong, we wrote this paper, which has appeared in Quantum, on generator coefficients, which is where we take a diagonal gate um, and we look at the the, uh, the process by which we make a measurement, apply a syndrome, and we want it to. Uh, we so we want to implement this logical operation. We have a physical operation, and we sort of go. And um, this is a long paper, even though we, we actually have running examples in that paper, which we think make it easier. I think we probably would not have got it past the reviewers if we didn't have the running examples. Um, this work that I talked about before, about climbing the Clifford hierarchy, we sort of made the, made the calculation that submitting both those papers would have been too much for a reviewer to swallow. So one just exists on archive and one is in quantum. <clears throat> the climbing paper is really beautiful. Um, and um, and this, is the, this is the theorem. So, so here we're talking about CSS codes. Uh, so here 
we have two classical codes, C2 and C1. C1 is obtained from C2 by augmenting it. Um, C2 defines the X stabilizers, C1 perp defines the C stabilizers. Um, and we're, we're looking for, um, for, for this diagonal looking at this diagonal physical gate. And this is like, these are like the conditions in triorthogonal codes. But I mean, triorthogonal codes is a little bit, you satisfy these conditions, something good happens. This theorem is like, you want something good to happen? This is what has to happen with respect to the codes. So the idea here is that these coefficients have to be um, uh, quite special. Um, they have to be the same in, uh, in a coset. And you can read off the, um, what, what the induced logical operator is. And um, the corollary here is that uh, you're, you're preserving this co-space, even only if all weights in each coset of C2 and C1 modulo 8 are the same. Okay, so this is like a triorthogonal. And this is the reason why in the start of the code, start of the talk, I talked about powers of two that divided um, weights. Here's an example, quantum reed muller code. That's the classical code. Um, and that's the, um, the, the, the simplex code. Um, here you have you're, you're sitting in the simplex code, all the weights are divisible by eight. If you're in a coset, they're all congruent to seven mod eight. And when you go through this framework um, with a T gate, this is what happens. You get a, a T dagger. Um, so that's just a picture. And um, here, um, one of the things that I, I liked very much about Anirudh's work on um, monomial codes is that you have freedom to poke around inside of reed muller codes. So here we're poking around. We're not taking all of the second order reed muller code. We're taking a piece of it. Um, when you go through the, uh, the diagonal gate exercise, um, apply it to these codes here. The induced transformation, this is what it looks like. And so I think one of my points in, 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 this, um, in, in this, this part of the talk is to say um, it's worth going prospecting among codes that finite, I mean, configurations of hyperplanes, things that finite geometers look at they might be interesting, yeah. Um, um, this is um, <clears throat> uh, this is this is a consequence of you know you trying to go high up in the uh, in the Clifford hierarchy. You want codes that are preserved by that because you know about the weights. You can get a you can get a, a result that says uh, these codes are these CSS codes are are fixed. So that's concluding remarks. In the beginning, you have Fisher and Hamming. And then you have Reed Muller, Reed Solomon codes. And then character of coding theory changes. Um, in our classical world, uh, Ed L. Arik um, looked at polar codes, looked at Reed Muller codes tried to figure out whether, wondered whether they were capacity achieving. Um, these teams proved that they, these codes achieve capacity on the bit, bit error, on the BEC. And these days in the quantum world, divisibility properties of reed muller code word weights turn out to be what's needed to produce codes that are invariant under certain diagonal transform. Field questions.
Experimental developments. So, I mean, I think the talks this afternoon were really interesting. I mean, what, what I, all right, so. Confession, I'm a coding theorist. I make my, actually, but a coding theorist of a certain kind. I make my living next to applications. Thinking that if I talk to experimentalists talk to physicists for long enough, I will discover something that I can do that they can't. Okay. So I'm interested in small codes that make a difference. I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in asymptotic results. Okay, now that's clearly a failure on my part. Um, but I think that this is a golden time for the first approach. Because people, experimentalists, are thinking about certain platforms. And this afternoon we heard some about those platforms. Those platforms have characteristics. Thinking about codes and code families that are motivated by those characteristics is, I think, really interesting. It's much more interesting than saying, I have this family of codes, I'm going to apply it to this no matter what. Right, so I think it's important to go the other way around. Yeah. So uh, there's another timeline here. I mean, it's the same timeline. Yeah. <laughs> there's some more bullet points on the timeline, having to do with fault tolerance. Yes. Going back to von Neumann. Yeah. You know, where does fault tolerance fit in? I mean, I, I, I ask you. <laughs> I mean, I think that, I mean, fault tolerance is much more complicated in the quantum world. Yeah. Because, um, you know, in the classical world, um, these, these, I mean, can just yeah. Off, I, like, I mean, your notion of resilient quantum computation here was a specific path to achieving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, um, yeah, like I guess I'm trying to uh, build some universe where I can uh, trace a path through history. And yeah, I, I don't know. Let, let me just leave it to you. I just wanted to highlight that you're considering a specific facet of fault tolerance when you say resilient. That's right. I mean, I'm, I'm in a sense, I'm, I'm fascinated by codes, and I'm fascinated by in the quantum world. I'm fascinated by things you can do in the physical world that leave something in the logical world fixed, that induce something on it. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about a particular world. There's another, I think, really interesting world. There's this new paper by Tetsiri and Kondisa on um, weird codes having to do with um, 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 the icosahedral group. Which I think is fantastically interesting. And maybe, you know, and so, you know, it's great that there's still algebraic avenues that, um, that we could explore. Yeah. I have two related questions. So the other class of codes with a lot of algebraic structure, BCH codes. Yeah. You didn't mention much about them, but it's number one related to that. Do you think as computation increases, eventually we will just go to algebra? I mean, the reason we went to LDPC codes is not so much that the codes are good, but they were very good under an algorithm that was easy to implement. Mm -hmm. At some point, if computation catches up, now we know that Riemuller codes achieve capacity for very long lengths. And still, BCH codes are probably among the best for short lengths, right? Should we just go back to algebraic codes decoded with some? I think the meta point is that what you do is a function of what can be done, right? As what can be done changes, so maybe your perspective changes. I do like the old codes that have a kind of symmetry to them because when you come to thinking about quantum operations, atomorphisms are useful. 
and um, and so I like I mean I like that. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, if not, then let's thank everybody again.